It's just like when you bleed with someone and you sweat with someone and you push each other through something, you feel bonded. Hey there, what's going on? Thanks for tuning in to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host and founder of the show. And today we're joined by Sensei Michael LaChapelle. If you're new to the show, if you haven't checked out any of the other 235 episodes that we've got over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, why don't you head on over there, check them out. Find out about everything that we've got going on as a show, or you can check out whistlekick.com. That's where we have links to all of our projects, all of our products, including our absolutely awesome sparring gloves with a a much longer lifespan than you're going to find on pretty much anything else. I will say anything else. These things are fantastic. I'm still wearing my original pre-production hand-cut pair from mid-2012, and it's end of 2017. So the gloves that I'm wearing are five years old. And you know what? They're still comfy. They still work. Today's guest is a multidisciplined martial artist who's embraced everything from karate to Filipino martial arts. He's done a lot of training, not only here in the United States, but also internationally. And his name is Sensei Michael LaChapelle. He hails from New Hampshire, and we've got some mutual friends, and it's because of another guest on the show that we connected, which I'm really appreciative of. I love when that happens. And his journey into the martial arts started from watching a movie. I'm not going to tell you what movie, and rather than telling you his story at all, I'd rather you hear it directly from him. So let's welcome him to the show. Sensei La Chapelle, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much for having me. Well, thank you for coming on. It's an honor. Of course, you are a, I guess we can say referral. We had a past guest suggest <laughs> that you come on the show, and I don't know if that's going to come up in our conversation. You know, if, if not, we'll we'll shout them out later. But I appreciate your time, you know, just as I appreciate everybody's time. And, you know, I'll say it again. I've said it before. I have one of the best jobs in the world. I get to talk to other martial artists about martial arts and call it work. I know. You do have a good job. I think it's unfortunate. One thing that can never work well is um, you can never have therapy for a bunch of martial artists because they just exchange technique and information with each other. It would never be uh, very useful in the end. (laughs) Well, maybe that is our therapy, right? There you go. You know, the idea, um, we, we have a, a social media post that, that pops up once in a while, and it's, you know you're a martial artist if you made a friend after hitting them in the head. True, true. <laughs> I have some of my best friends from that. So. Exactly. And it's something that we only seem to grasp within the martial arts outside, you know, maybe rugby. Rugby might be an exception, I would say, too. yeah, rugby might be another one, too. You Definitely. Know, those, those guys are kind of rugged. But we're not here to talk about rugby. We're here to talk about martial arts, maybe a little bit of martial arts therapy if we go there. Sure. Let's go way back. Let's go back. How, however far that's going to be. How did you start with martial arts? Um, sure. I, I was like many people. Uh, I think 35 years ago, uh, I was on a trip and I saw the movie The Karate Kid out in Michigan. And just by chance, um, my best friend who I've known since we were six years old, Uh, His uncle was a very avid martial artist, and there was a wedding going on, and we were very fortunate to have um, a gentleman named Ron Fox, who was a nuclear engineer, I still remember him very clearly, and Otaka from uh, Japan, and they ended up doing kendo for us. And, you know, as young kids, how more exciting can it be than to have a stick and whack your best friend in the head and be told it's good? Um, So we started out kind of doing that. We, We were there for a week. We had a great time. They treated us very well. They did a very big ceremony for us, receiving um, a shanai and a, a kendo sword. And we ended up uh, coming back to New Hampshire, and both of us tried to find the fastest class we could get into for karate, actually, because that was kind of the popular art back in the early 80s. So um, at around 11, I started um, looking at schools, and there was a school probably about an hour and a half from my house, and it was a traditional Okinawan school. Uh, it taught uh, gujuru karate. And then... I was fortunate to find out a gentleman a little bit closer who taught uh, Wichiru and Shoranu karate. And um, I started out with, um, uh, well, at that time it was uh, Renshi um, Banavram. And I ended up going probably from age 11 to 18 I trained. The problem, however, was I hit my growth spurt really young. And uh, I was always put in adult classes, so I never even had a kid's class. Um, I was very tall for my age. So sometimes I had to remind the adults that I was only 11 or 12. Um, and not that it was 17 or 18 years old, but it was a great experience. And I get to study some um, very traditional arts with some very good teachers, actually. Yeah. So, of course, you know, the idea of 
getting to do some kendo as a young kid. I mean, that, that's exciting. I think we can all connect with that and say, yeah, that, that makes sense. Even somebody who might not be interested in yeah. what we can call more traditional unarmed martial arts would look at that and say, yeah, I want to hit my friend with a stick. <laughs> but something about that beyond the idea of working with the sword intrigued you because you came back and you you didn't jump into kendo. There was something in there that resonated even at a young age. And Any thoughts on what that was? Um, I was a, like I said, I was a pretty tall kid being young and, um, I was a very quiet kid. So a lot of older kids thought or expected more from me. So to be very frank, I think a lot of times, um, I was treated as an older kid and if I didn't react the way they wanted to, or if they didn't get the kind of the maturity they were looking for, they would sometimes try to start things with me physically. Um, so I ended up for self-protection as well as just some confidence. I really thought, thought that, you know, karate would be the great thing or any martial art at the time, because I didn't know a lot about the different arts, uh, would be a great opportunity for me. And I found that it was also a great way for me to um, spend time in a very productive way. Uh, as much as my job is currently, I'm a very much, I'm, I have to be on most of the time. I'm working in an environment where I have to be able to speak in a public realm. I have to work with adults and children. But the reality is I'm more of an introvert, introvert excuse me, than anything else. And the martial arts allowed me to use that time to kind of spend that time by myself in a productive manner. And, uh, and I have always been thankful for that actually. Mm. Now, as you were talking, you mentioned karate being the popular art of -hmm. the time, which kind of implies to me that maybe you've stepped off and you're doing some things other than Weichiru and and Goju. Yep. Goju. Um, yeah, I I definitely, I've, like I said, I think I've been fortunate. Uh, I started out, in high school, like I said, I did Wichiru, Gujiru, and Shorinru. Then I went to college and I did Shotokan and Taekwondo. Um, after college, I studied uh, Nimpo with Mark Davis and Jeet Kundo with a guy named Mike Perry. And I was very lucky. Um, around 1995, or no, I'm sorry, uh, end of 94, I flew and lived in South Korea for about four years. And while I was there, I was teaching English as a second language, but it allowed me to really study the arts kind of, you know, in the homeland. Um, I picked up Hapkido and Kuk Suluwan for my first year. And then my teacher saw that I was pretty fr- proficient. So he recommended um, judo, which in Korea they call yudo. Same symbols, just different pronunciation. So for the next four years, I like literally trained six days a week, three hours every day, doing Hapkido, um, judo, and Kuk Suluwan. Uh, when I came back to America in n- end of 98, beginning of 99, um, I continued with judo, but then I picked up for some Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And then I really fell in love with the Filipino arts of Kali. And I've had a very great opportunity to study Kali and um, Salat for the last oof, maybe 11 years. But uh, for the last four and a half years, I've been training under Guru Guy Chase, who is fairly famous um, studying under Dan Santo and um, living out there and again under Carl Gotch for catch wrestling and so forth. But um, I've always had judo as kind of my art that I've loved to teach the public and work with kids. So I've kind of jumped around. I go from the Southeast Asian arts um, to the Japanese arts to the Korean arts. Uh, like I said, I, I feel very fortunate to have a lot of different teachers and the opportunity to study these arts. It's been about 35 years now. Uh, so I've had some pretty good exposure, to say the least. Yeah, I, I think that's quite the understatement. You know, folks that are, are used to checking out the show notes know that we will tag episodes with the, the style or, or sometimes styles that our sure. guests will have. And, you know, I've got quite the list for you. I mean, even if we just focus on the things that it sounds like you've trained in for at least a year, let's say. That's, oh, I mean, that's, that's, that's a long list. There's a lot going yeah. on there. Yeah. Um, and I've been very fortunate. I, I think the friends I've made have been very open about doing different arts and sharing the knowledge. Um for the last maybe 10 years, I've been going out to California doing a thing called Masters on the Mountain. And that's everything from guys doing MMA to Tai Chi to Sistema to whatever. And the first day, we just beat the crap out of each other. And the next day, we just try to do a lot of healing. But it's been a very good bonding experience, getting a different perspective. And it may sound strange, but like the West Coast mindset's a little bit different than the East Coast martial art mindset. And that's always been kind of fun between the two groups talking about that. Um, it's been a great opportunity. I have some teachers who are quite a bit older than me. They're in their late 80s, well, excuse me, early 80s, late 70s, you know, and they always call me their big brother, uh, jokingly, 
because I'm, I'm a pretty big size guy compared to some of them. But the things that we've shared and the knowledge I've gained from them is invaluable. Uh, I could never trade that for anything in the world. And some of the things that I've learned about myself, the fact is, yeah, you may think you're the toughest guy in the room at some point, which I never have thought of myself that way. But watching a guy who's 76 years old and play mercy with a group of bunch of young 23 year old guys and be the last one standing, you have to question sometimes, you know, just that old school mentality and toughness, uh, which has been, it's been neat. It really has. Um, I haven't been there in the last couple of years due to their, some of the illnesses the instructors have had, because unfortunately age, no matter how great you are and how healthy you want to keep yourself up to be, it does sometimes catch up to you. Yeah. Yeah. I, the thing that we all do and love is not always easy on our body. And it's very true. It's, it's kind of easy to see that as we get older. Now I'm curious because a lot of us haven't had the opportunity to train, you know, at a, at a far, dis, far away distance. And certainly few of us have had that opportunity enough times to draw a comparison between the East coast martial arts attitude towards training and the, and the West coast. We've had plenty of folks from both coasts and through the Midwest and all over the country and even the world now come on the show, but you might be in a sort of unique position to compare the two. And for those of us that haven't had those opportunities, how would you contrast them? Um, and just, as just my own personal experience. I've had the guys in the West coast, especially like the Brazilian juicy guys, um, a lot of times are very laid back. And I think they also, due to the weather, are able to train more consistently throughout the year. Uh, here on the East Coast, of course, with the changing of the seasons, I think that there are certain times martial arts are great for an indoor activity. But when the weather starts to loosen up a little bit, everyone wants to be outside as much as possible. So the training may either change in the environment you train in or it may kind of drop off over that period of time. Uh, but the guys on the West Coast, some of the guys that I've trained with, they have a little bit more of an open mindset of, hey, let's try different stuff. Let's, you know, that's great. That What did you just do? Tell me a little bit about that. While I've had a little bit more difficulty on the East Coast, you know, being very respectful when I enter a dojo or a dojang or, you know, a cheokwan or whatever, um, I'm very careful to always make sure that I want to be sharing what I've been asked to share or making sure that I give very clear props to whatever art that's being taught in that school. And the West Coast is not so much. I mean, the guys give each other a hard time at least in my experience about, you know, they can kind of be honest about the areas of weakness in some of their arts and they'll ask to find gaps to how to fill that up on the East coast. It takes a little bit more time, I think, to make that friendship and establish that. And it does happen, but it takes over a little bit pe longer period of time because people are a little bit more, I, I wouldn't say guarded, but just like in, in you know, the, the new England aspect of living, you take longer to make friends, but once you make friends, you have lifelong friends. Um, and that's just kind of my observation of the situation. Whether that's 100 percent true or not, who knows? Well, there, it's an opinion, and you know there there are no there are no right opinions. But I, I would say that based on my limited exposure, and certainly folks that have been listening to a lot of the episodes of the show may may be able to agree with me that that yeah, I mean, I think I'm right there with you. It's it's not always easy to convince a martial artist in New England that uh, that what they're doing is wrong. To the point where it's certainly not something I go out of my way to do. Yeah, I try not to do that. It's not usually <laughs> the way I want to be thought of. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that certainly gives us some some ideas of who you are and, and how you got where you are. And, and of course, any of us reading between the lines, as, as I am, we're starting to build a picture about what makes you tick. But now it's story time. Okay. Mar Martial Arts Radio is all about stories. And, you know, really, we built the entire format around... How do we get people to tell stories? Because I love hearing great martial arts stories. If I was to ask you for your favorite martial arts story, what would that be? My favorite martial arts story. Hmm. That's a tough one. Um, I, there's, there's a couple. I, I guess I, I will tell you one that actually involves a friend of mine. And, and I think the story is, is great because um, there's a gentleman named Sam. And Sam is, is probably the most unique individual I've ever met in my life. He is in his late 80s. Uh, he has 14 kids. Um, he, you know, gets pulled over all the time by the police because he's literally hitting himself with different types of metal, getting the energy. Um, Sam has written six books in the last five years. You know, we're talking late 70s and 80s. But his martial arts, he studied extensively in Taiwan. Um, and he studied also with uh, William Chen for a long time. One of my favorite stories of Sam, and I'll never forget this, around martial arts was – Sam was actually um, in Nepal for many years, and he was a guard at the embassy. And he was talking about, 
you know, at that time he believed himself to be a, a, just a tough guy. You know, his late twenties, he'd been doing different types of training. Um, he worked with different types of special forces and he was, he thought of himself as really a badass to be very frank. And he said what ended up happening was there was a huge um, riot that broke out outside of the embassy. And he saw that the people were carrying bricks and stones and, and sticks and stuff. And he's trying to figure out, well, what can I do? And he knew he didn't want to use a firearm. And he was very clear orders that he was not supposed to. So as this, the situation started to get more and more volatile, Sam kind of thought about what can I do at this moment? What am I going to do? And someone threw a stone at him. And he said it was like slow motion. He saw the stone coming and he stepped out of the way and it kind of fell next to him. And then someone threw another stone and the same thing kept happening. And he said, you know, it was like unreal. He couldn't believe it was happening. And he thought it was absolutely incredible. He's like, this is just amazing. He kept thinking this was just like supernatural powers. Then all of a sudden it was black. When he woke up, um, his friend mentioned to him, he says, you know, we're very glad we got you out of this situation. He goes, what are you talking about? I was, uh, I was able to avoid any conflict. He goes, what are you talking about? You were hit in the back of the head in the first three seconds and you're knocked out. So that just kind of makes me laugh because Sam is uh, a very humble person, but he realized that whatever his skills were, that's not the he wasn't a Superman. And to this day, he's a pretty impressive guy. He's like a, I think he's the world light heavyweight champion in push hands. But he always emphasizes that no matter what you think you're doing at that moment, the reality is somewhere else. And uh, that story's always kind of stuck with me ever since I've known him, which has been about twenty years now. Some some pretty poignant wisdom in there, whether you want to take it on a an emotional, mental level or a physical level. You know, the idea that it doesn't matter how how many people you can evade or dodge, you know, uh, if one sneaks behind you, it's all over. Right. We, we, we don't do well being able, you know, with our ability to see or react to things behind us. So he sounds like quite an impressive man. Sam is. Um, Sam always downplays himself consistently as a, he always says, I'm a terrible martial artist. Teach me something. But um, my first memory with him actually was at a thing called the Family Gathering out in Colorado uh, for the Detois brothers. Um, William Detois is one of the last of the four brothers. Uh, they come from um, Indonesia and they study an art that's a family art that's a couple hundred years old. And my first opportunity, I was a young guy, probably 28, 29. Um, and I went out there. I didn't know anybody. And I was joining these different little subgroups that were training. And I saw this guy that everyone was kind of avoiding, this crazy, you know, older gentleman. And I went to another group and he happened to be there and he was my partner. And several people walked up to him and said, Sam, you know, take it easy on this guy. And I'm thinking, who, who the hell is this? So the gentleman teaching the session was talking about doing some type of wrist lock and breaking a grip and so forth. And he was explaining about, the, you know, the physics of it and turning your body and so forth. And uh, he says, okay, I want you to work with a partner and the partner's going to grab you and practice this. Well, Sam grabbed my pectoral muscle so hard, I thought he was going to rip it off my chest. And I remember thinking, this is ridiculous, the amount of pain. And I kept trying to do the lock, kept trying to do the technique, I couldn't do it. So finally, I had to smack him in the face for him to let go. And I smacked him in the face hard enough that he let go and he looked at me and says, ha, ha, that was great. He goes, let's do it again. And he's the most sincere and non-egotistical person, but he really wanted to see if the technique worked. And that's kind of what we've all had to deal with Sam is now is uh, is our meter if something truly can work or not is if you can do it on Sam. Um, so he's a very interesting gentleman to say the least. But he's never done anything in the, the 20 years I've known him to really try to make someone look bad or, or try to say, you know, this doesn't work. He just wants to figure out for himself, is it really effective? And uh, sometimes Sam has to take a few bumps and bruises to realize it works. Well, I, I think we can all, well, maybe not all of us, hopefully all of us can speak to the value of having a training partner like that that'll push us that'll you know kind of read through the bs and say yeah sure i, I want to know if this works and i'm willing to sacrifice my body a little bit to find out if it will but i can totally see why you hold him in such high regard and why you've established a friendship that's lasted so long yeah definitely outside the martial arts is there is there anything that keeps your interest any hobbies yeah, definitely. Um, what I'm living in, you know, the area that I live in, um, hunting is very popular. I've never been a big hunter, but I've enjoyed um, using the bow and arrow. Um, I've been going to, lately I've been using a crossbow, but previously I've used a compound bow. Um, I do tons of hiking and kayaking because that's just part of like this area that I live in. And uh, my son um, is an avid video game player, so I'm trying to learn to play some video games against him. Um, we've made a deal that he would train more with me if I played some games with him. 
So it's been interesting so far. He uh, he whoops my butt on the screen with something, and then I come back and I can whip his butt in the dojo, and we kind of laugh about it. But um, a lot of my time also spent reading. I read various types of literature, anything from professional works in my field of education to a more fiction. I love some of the, there's some great works of fiction out there. And um, lately I've been reading, um, oh my goodness, I can't even think of the name of the series now, uh, the Jack Reacher series, um, which has been pretty much better than the films. Mm, um, so that. I've been reading those books. And uh, then I have three kids. So a lot of my time is spent with them. Um, once you have children, you realize your life is truly not your own anymore. Um, it becomes, becomes theirs. I love that that deal, that exchange you have with your son training for, for video games. It sounds like you're both winning on, well, both, it's funny on both sides of that. Yeah, he actually um, – I brought in three different instructors because he just never wanted to train with me. And we started this around age five. And now that he's 14, he says, Dad, you're not too bad. Can I train with you? And I just started laughing. I'm like, oh, my gosh. It took this many years, huh? And it took the video games to get you to actually do it. So it's it's been a good journey though. Now he wants to train. I do know a lot of instructors who tried to get their kids to train with them, and um, it didn't turn out very well, actually. Uh, often they felt forced or the kids lost interest very quickly, and it's kind of disheartening to the parent. But I think when kids find it on their own, they're very enthusiastic about it. Completely agree. I mean, the, the best way to get kids to do anything is to model the behavior you're looking for, to show them right. the benefits rather than say, you have to do this. Right. I'd like you to... Reflect back on your life now. We, we all have these difficult times, and martial artists have this way of getting through the tough stuff, the rough spots that non-martial artists just don't. We have a, a, a broader toolbox, more things in there that we can use. Think about a tough time that you've had and tell us how you got through it. Hmm. Um, that's a tough question, actually. Uh well, I, I, I guess probably the, a very tough time and still has some little bit of difficulties with it is uh, I had actually met my son's mother in Korea and we were together for about 10 years. She was a pharmacist there. We moved back here to the United States. Um, her family was actually kind of neat. They they adopted me and, and they taught me a lot of things about Korean culture and, and her parents actually, um, her uncles and her father were both martial artists. So that kind of helped me get into the family. When we came back here, uh, I realized that there was a big difference of culture and there's a big difference of our age. Actually, she's about eight years older than me. Um, and we had decided to get divorced and actually, uh, my son was conceived, uh, which was odd cause it, it was age 40 when she was, she got pregnant. So it became a time of us to kind of think about what we wanted to do. For the next few years, I wanted to make sure that my son was going to see there as a part of his life. So for me to do that, it was kind of getting through the daily grind, the things that I knew I had to to work through to get the thing I wanted. And that was to have a good, strong relationship with my son. And, and at the time, I was hoping maybe to repair you know, my marriage. Many of my friends and even my family said, what are you doing? Why don't you just leave? You know, wh why are you enduring this? And I kept trying to say to them, you know, this is what needs to happen to get where I want to go, which is I want a strong relationship with my son. And in the end, I think it was the fact of learning that, you know, to get through those times of discomfort, that time of displeasure, you know, even times of question, like, why am I doing this? It, I was able to see that th the goal in sight was to be able to have a better relationship in the end. And it worked out really well for me. I actually have my son um, more than half the time. And we have a very strong relationship. And I look back thinking if I didn't have that fortitude and the years of dealing with discomfort and dealing with um, hardship, I had many teachers when I was going through the martial arts traditionally that they didn't care how long you're in the art. They didn't, you know, it wasn't caring that we do tests every month. It was they made a determination when your heart was in it and what you were trying to get to. They kind of made a lot of judgment from that. I was able to do that for myself as well. I learned, you know, this is like, sound like a silly thing, but I remember as a kid before they had emails and stuff, getting a letter was a big deal. I taught myself to, even when I get that letter that first day to put it aside and wait 24 hours to open it. And those little things of doing that, teaching myself discipline made it so I can endure a lot more. Um, and it's helped me definitely in that situation. And it's helped me get through some hardship as time's gone on. Also, uh, my son now at 14 is, is, a lot more aware of the situation, understands, you know, why things were the way they were. And 
has said to me, thank you, you know, and then that kind of blew me away. He said, thank you for always uh, thinking of me and putting me in that situation. So that was tough and it's still tough because, you know, you you have a child going to another home and you don't have control over that. But the good thing about it is through having years of experience, years of discipline and being able to deal with those highs and lows of training, because I think most of us go through that period like, why am I even doing this anymore? Why am I continuing with this art? And kind of pushing yourself through it to kind of continue um, helped me a lot. I don't know if that's what you're kind of referring to, but that's what kind of comes to mind. Absolutely. You know, it, it's one of the things that I find interesting is that when when a lot of us hit these difficult patches in our lives, we get we become very withdrawn. But what I found is that we all experience this stuff. And so one of the reasons I enjoy asking this question is it reminds everyone listening that, you know, you may be going through something difficult, but there's someone else out there going through something similar. And there's mm-hmm. somewhere along the way that is going through something that dwarfs what you're going through. And so just right. to remember that, you know, to, to be open to, you know, the people around you that, that love you, to, to lean on people that you train with for support, whatever it is that there are options other than closing off and, and a hiding. Sure. Definitely. And I think many times for me, actually, it was that, um, going to the dojo or going to the dojang or whatever you want to call it. A lot of times that allowed me to feel alive and kind of for those hour to two hours of training, you get to kind of suspend all those other things and focus on something that requires you truly to pay attention and, and when you do that, you get to kind of realize everything else may not be as uh, heavy on your shoulders, that burden. Um, and even, to, you know, my wife and I moved into this house about two years ago. And one of the first things she said to me, knowing who I am, she says, there's a perfect space downstairs for you to have a good sized dojo. And that was, you know, it was amazing to me. That's the first thing she thought of when we saw our home. And I laughed and I said, you know what, you know me well. And my three-year-old since age one has been to say the word dojo which blows our family away. She's like, daddy, I want to go to the dojo. And they're like, how does she know what that is? I'm like, cause that's where daddy goes. So <laughs> she wants to go down there and train. Um, and it's nice because having two little girls, I want them to be strong. I want them to feel confident. I want them to be empowered to do whatever they choose to do. But I also want the reality of the situation is it's a violent world. There's things going on right now that are, are pretty scary. And I want them to feel confident that they can survive it or be at least aware of situations and not put themselves in it if it's possible. Um, I also teach Krav Maga and I've been doing Krav Maga for about eight years and I studied with um, Moshe Katz and Moni Izik and they're very different men. One is a rabbi and one is an ex-military special forces and one has children and one does not. And it, I find it fascinating to hear their, way, their view on violence and their view on self-defense and, and the religion definitely comes into it sometimes. But when I talk about my kids to either one of them, they both have the same answer. Just, you know, give them confidence and make them feel good and strong. And that'll help them carry them through the world. And I just always found that fascinating from different cultures, from different philosophies, different, you know, experiences. When it comes back to the fact is, you know, we all kind of have a basic understanding of what we want our children to have. Um, And that's been a great avenue when you want to talk about meeting someone and training someone. I've trained with some people that are a little bit hard to, um, to get to know. But when they see you around kids or they see you around their children, they warm up instantly and there's a definite bond there because there's that commonality, as we've talked about. You know, martial artists can share stories and experience and techniques. And sometimes politics come in place and sometimes um, just experiences, you know, preconceived notions about other arts and so forth or people. But you throw a kid in the mix and it's a total different world. Um, and And I really appreciate that factor of it. Children are an amazing opportunity to to show us not only what we know or what we don't know, but all the things that we had never even considered as mm-hmm. options. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, anybody that's that's taught children that has been incredibly explicit with instructions to kids, thinking that that was what was going to get the result they wanted, and at least one of them will come up with a way around those instructions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you didn't say. You weren't clear enough. Right, right. Actually, it's funny because you mentioned that um, when I was, uh, I, the last 10 years, I've been a principal and assistant principal in public schools. And the school I just left was grades um, K through eight. And they allowed me actually to teach judo uh, three days a week to about 45 kids. I would just throw my tie off, throw my gi on, throw my belt on, 
and they actually bought um, training mats and geese for all the kids. It started out the first year only like 10 kids. They were called that risk population. By the third year, we had over 40 kids. And the teachers would keep coming to me saying, hey, can I have this kid join? Can I have this kid join? And I was laughing, thinking, okay, you know, this is getting bigger and bigger. And it was such an amazing experience because as an assistant principal, you have a disciplinary role. As their sensei, I had a different role. And they had a much greater concern about disappointing their sensei than the assistant principal. The assistant principal was a guy who walked around the building with a tie and, and you know, made sure everyone followed the rules. But when I was the sensei, it was, you know, sensei, today I did dot, 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 or, hey, there was a problem in the cafeteria, and I told the kid to stop and leave me alone, and I walked away, and I made some distance. And I, I realized the value and the power of that. And, um, you know, one of the things that I've always had hoped, and I know that in Japan, judo is still taught now um, to middle school age and older kids as part of the public education system, and that was kind of the, the principle of Jigoro Kano was what he had hoped. The founder of judo was that was going to occur. Well, I, I would love to see more of that in public schools because every time I've seen some type of program that's run well, kids have grown and, and really got a lot from it, especially um, kids who may not be able to do like a typical athletic type activity. It allows them to kind of glow at their own speed, their own their own you know difficulties. They may have to go through those challenges. They can overcome that. Um, and that's, I think, is absolutely the most amazing gift we can give any kid to give that confidence. But it also gives teachers... And it gives adults something to look at saying, maybe we need to look at a different way of teaching and a different way of, of having expectations for our kids. Uh, I had a student who, um, unfortunately, his father was incarcerated for a pretty violent crime. And the, and the young man was very angry, to say the least. And any time um, another kid approached him or came towards him or surprised him, he would be very violent and come out and hit him or throw something at him or strike him. And by the end of the third year, he was my best student. I actually allowed him to teach the class. Um, I could hear him using my words and some of the you know the philosophies I gave. Uh, it was absolutely incredible. And it that was probably the best experience of my life as far as professionally and or you know, just the martial arts was watching this young man take that role and become an incredibly positive leader. He went from being the kid who everyone was afraid to be around to, hey, can you be the kid who helps me? And he would be very happy to do so. And that was through the martial arts. And, and you know, there was no way around it. There was nothing else that was that factor that had such a strong influence. And it was neat to see. He had success, and that success just kept building upon himself. Um, he's now in high school, actually, which is <laughs> starting to feel a little bit old. But he's in high school now, and he actually just reached out a couple times to me, asking me you know, to come and train with me uh, as he's gotten older. So it's, it's been a neat, a neat road in that regard. It's so cool to be able to have an impact on people, you know, whether it's adults <laughs> or children, but to take a kid that is so clearly in need yeah and and to have another set of skills beyond assistant principal beyond what the state the school district enable you to do to use martial arts to mm -hmm. help him heal to help him move forward and and have such a dramatic experience i don't know if everyone listening has had that kind of experience if they are an instructor but you know, teaching is, is so rewarding. And I can hear that in your voice is, you know, here's the common thread in what you do. You are an educator, you know, whether it's martial arts or professionally, I guess, I guess non-martial sure. arts. And it's clear how passionate you are about that. And I'm going to guess it's because you enjoy seeing that growth in others and knowing that you had a hand in it. Definitely. I mean, I think that's, um, as many young people and as many people get into the martial arts, I think, there's sometimes there's certain factors that influence you. And for me, uh, I think it was, it gave me a lot of confidence. It also gave me a, a positive place to go. Uh, and with that, I kind of wanted to pass that on. I was very fortunate um, to have people assist me in pretty tough times. Um, I, I had a scholarship to college and unfortunately I was injured and I lost my scholarship. And a woman who I didn't even know, her husband was a professor on the campus, uh, they paid for my last two years of college. Uh, they trusted me and they didn't know me. They had just seen me around campus. They heard little things about me. But because of like kind of my interaction, I actually introduced um, the first martial arts club at the college I went to. Um, they trusted that I would pay them back when I get out. And I did actually. When I went to Korea, that was one of the first things I did was pay back all my loans, pay back my physical debt. But when I came back from Korea, they were the first people I went to visit to show them, you know, how thankful I was that these experiences wouldn't happen without them. But 
when I asked, um, you know, what was the deciding factor, the uh, the person who, who did this, and the reason I'm not using names is because they they're still alive, sure, and they kind of they're very quiet people. Um, they said that you know what the big factor was. Every day I walked around the campus, having an air of confidence, but not um, an air of arrogance. And I I laughed about that. I said, well, what do you mean by that? And they said, you seem very approachable, but very comfortable with who you are. And I realized, you know, that was definitely from feeling confident from many years of training. And it's also just, I think it, it kind of comes across when you go to a job interview or you go to, you know, where you have to kind of be in front of a group of people. Not everyone can do that. And I know I wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't had that exposure at a younger age of, of building that confidence. And I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. And I had an instructor um, at a young age who really wanted me to, he saw potential and he kept emphasizing, you know, there are times, sometimes I couldn't pay for classes and he would say, you know what, don't worry about it. Get me next month. And, you know, if I couldn't do it next month, he said, get it the month after, don't worry. Um, and I still have a connection to him, which is kind of neat. You know, it's been many, many years, uh, but those are relationships that kind of don't disappear, even though you may fall out with someone as far as politics or philosophy or just life may take you other paths. You always still have that bond. And that's a huge thing. And I, and I enjoy having that bond with my students. Martial arts seems to form those bonds and yeah. and temper them, solidify them in a way that few other things do. I'm not going to yeah. say it's the only place, but... No, no. You yeah. know, it's, it's just like when you bleed with someone and you sweat with someone and you push each other through something, you feel bonded. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. For sure. Other than, let's say, your principal instructors, and I'll, I'll let you define that group however you like, who has been the most influential person on your martial arts training? Other than my principal instructors? Yeah. Other than my principal instructors? My wife. Okay. My, my, and my, I'm saying my wife because my wife, um, I'm, I'm six foot two, I weigh about 250 pounds. My wife is five foot one weighs maybe 107 pounds. Um, when we first started dating, I taught her martial arts, but the difference in, you know, the reality of the difference of our sizes is there's certain techniques that don't work for her. Also, she is legally blind in one eye, which I didn't know for the first three years of us dating. Um, so she was much more sensitive about like having contact and touch. So I found like jujitsu and judo worked really well for her. And that was great. And then as I started to go, as we started to, you know, have a relationship and, and got married and all that, um, she was always good about pulling me back and saying, well, Michael, remember, not everyone is your physical size or your attitude or your abilities. You have to think of the person as an individual and how would you adapt that? And every time now I go to class, I think about that. Um, and it sounds strange, but it, that was a huge factor for me. I had to kind of reanalyze techniques. I had to think about the principles of the techniques. I had to kind of think about the energy and the attitude of it. And she was an amazing factor for that. Now it's to the point where, you know, for a short period of time when the UFC was a huge craze, we used to watch uh, the fights together. She would be able to tell me who was going to win based on how they're moving or their techniques. And I was laughing, thinking, what are you talking about? And she was often very accurate. Um, so she's been a very positive influence because even now with our daughters, she says, you know, that's great when she'll see me do a technique or she'll watch me train with a bunch of guys and she'll say, but could you have our daughters do that? And then I have to kind of analyze it and go, wow, you're right. I relied way too much on strength there or too much on speed or, or my size or, you know, whatever else. And that's been a very positive influence in, my, in, in the arts. Um, she's also been able to remind me that not to just go train with, you know, just these big burly guys, but to train with all different people and learn different skills. And that's been very helpful. Um, my, a lot of my Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructors are, are small guys and their technique is flawless and amazing. And that's been very helpful that I can come back and share that with my students. Cause I know that it's the technique and you know, it's the application of that technique that's important. So I, I really have to say my wife has been a huge influence and I know somebody's probably now going, Oh, it's so cheesy, but it's a reality. Well, it, it may be cheesy, but I'm going to guess anyone that's going to say that doesn't have someone that understands your passion for for the martial arts in, in the way that they would like. I, I think any of sure. us that train, you know, as a, as a single man, I'm going to say that the dream is someone who is as passionate about martial arts as, as I am, but you know, that's, that's not, that's not common. 
No, even no. among martial arts practitioners. I mean, th- this no. is this is my career. I think. Excuse me. Anyone can understand that it's going to be hard for me to find somebody that that is on that level. But second to that is someone who understands that level of passion. And sure. while that may not be still easy to find, likely easier to find. And yeah. you know, it's it's nice to have different perspectives, different as you're articulating, different sizes, different experiences within within the home to to share both in and outside of martial arts. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, unfortunately, my biggest regret is actually teaching my wife some Filipino arts because um, once in a while she thinks it's funny to use it when I'm least expecting it. <laughs> and uh, we still to this day, I have to explain to her hitting me while I'm driving is not a good idea. Um, you know, she thinks it's funny. And uh, I keep telling her, you know, doing a good thing is not the right. It's not the right place for time, I love. So she feels very empowered as well. I can I can just see it. I can just see it now. If you could train with anyone that you haven't, and it, mm-hmm. I mean you've got quite a list of of people and, and arts and everything. But if if there was someone that you haven't trained with, they could be alive, they could have passed away anywhere in the world, any style. Who would you want to train mm-hmm. with? Uh, that's a that's a tough one. Um, I have to think about that. Any style, any person. I, I guess for me. Growing up, I was always in love with the Japanese arts first and foremost because they were kind of more readily available. And I remember reading the Book of Five Rings by Musashi Miyamoto, and I would love the opportunity to see the man. And and, and if there was not a language barrier, if there was some way to uh, communicate, to see what that real world experience was and, and how did he develop those skills and just his philosophy from a younger age to an older age. Um, that would be my first choice. The next would definitely be uh, Dr. Jigoro Kano. I think Okano, uh, Okano Sensei would be definitely the the other person I would love to have an opportunity to spend time with. Great answers. Let's talk about competition. Sure. You know, as martial artists, we like to test ourselves, whether that's, you know, with our training partners in the dojo or, you know, head out to a competition. Sure. Have, have you done any formal competing? Uh, yeah. When I, when I was younger, I did. Um, I, I actually, in Korea... I was the only Caucasian in um, about 50, what they call their Cheokwans, uh, that taught judo. And my teacher was actually for a Korean person, very big. Um, not to say, not, but most Koreans are, are tall but thin. He was just massive. His training partner was the 1998 gold medalist in judo, and he was a, a big guy. And um, he never wanted me to, to compete while I was training. And then what ended up happening, my first competition ever, which was crazy, was going for my second degree black belt. The way they do it in Korea, um, because you can go to a university and learn a martial art as your college degree, um, it's kind of like a PE background, but you focus on a specific martial art. You go to this, what they call a university, which is a Dehakyo. And I went to uh, Pusan Dehakyo, which is Pusan National University. And what they ended up doing there was um, you take everyone in the city who's competing to earn the rank of second degree, and you have to win two out of three of your matches to go to the next part of the testing. And it was my first time ever competing. And um, I actually did very well. I was able to um, to get my second degree black belt and I was able to get uh, full points. And I enjoyed it actually a lot. It was like the first time I ever really competed in martial arts. And when I came back from Korea, I did a couple Brazilian jiu-jitsu tournaments, some judo tournaments. Um, I did a couple no-gi tournaments. Um, I, and my, probably my big biggest overall kind of well-known ones. I competed in the U.S. Jiu-Jitsu Championships in 2004, and I received the bronze medal um, for heavyweight division. And that was kind of a neat competition. You had to score a full point with a strike, a full point with a throw, and a full point with a submission. And if you had one of each of those, you'd win. So theoretically, I, you know, you hit the guy, you throw him and submit him, you win. But if you get with somebody who's a karate practitioner and kicked you a bunch of times, they would score points, but be missing points out of the other two areas. Um, I had done really well, except I had lost a ton of weight. I went down to 207 pounds, um, weighing in, and I found out after the weight limit was 207 and above. I needed to lose one more pound. Um, and the next smallest guy in my division was 245. And I actually had beaten the first two guys who got the gold and the silver, but the third guy I hit and my arm uh, literally popped out of socket. So he was a big boy. I think he was around 285. And... Um, after that, I decided, you know what, maybe this is not competing is for me. So it's been quite a few years since I've done that. But I've gotten a lot of second places and a few first place. Cool. 
let's talk about entertainment, pop culture, if you will. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Martial artists, we, we tend to get pretty passionate one way or the other. Most of us are really into martial arts movies, and yeah. we've had plenty of folks on the show who say the cheesier, the better. Yeah. Where do <laughs> you Saturday. fall? Every Saturday. Every Saturday. I remember okay. those. Tell, tell us about your favorite martial arts movies. Um, some of my favorite martial arts movies are actually, I love Tony Ja. I think he's awesome. Um, his is Umbach in that series. Just to see a different type of martial arts has been great. And it took me many years to admit this, but Keanu Reeves actually is a decent martial artist. Um, I, I have to say the John Wick series has been pretty good to watch as well. Um, but it's kind of not really the martial arts, more of the style being shown. I, I really like any of the Bourne movies. Um, I've fallen in love with the Filipino arts for like the last 15 years, 16 years, maybe a little longer. And I love watching uh, Matt Damon do some of the stuff that, you know, that's influenced by Dan and Asanto. Uh, those are definitely some of my favorite. But the ultimate movie for me in modern times would be The Raid. I, I think The Raid is an amazing flick that shows um, Indonesian arts in a very different light. And my wife refuses to watch it with me. So when I have guys come over and we watch it, you know, there's a lot of yelling and stuff. And she just she actually works in a field where uh, they deal with head trauma. And she says, how many stuntmen did they go through for that movie? That's just ridiculous. And I keep explaining they're very cheap. So don't worry about it. But um, I would have to say The Raid is definitely my favorite flick. As a kid, The Five Deadly Venoms. I mean, that was that was the ultimate. Mm, Bring it up an old one. I know I'm old. <laughs> but it's certainly a classic and. And anybody that's seen it knows why. It's fantastic. Tony Jaw, of course, an amazing martial artist, an amazing oh, yeah. martial arts actor, and and somebody that I wish we had seen more from. He seems to have, yeah, you know, had had that early success, and for some reason, he doesn't seem like he's getting the castings that he deserves. Is there right. anybody else that you look at on screen and say that guy or, or or that gal? They really know what's going on. Um, I'm trying. To, oh my god, I can't even think of his name. Uh. Michael Jai White, I think it's, I think I'm saying his name wrong. Yeah, J A I White. Yeah, that that's that yeah. is his name. Okay, that's yeah, how you he say is, it. He is amazing. I mean, that guy, the way he moves, the way he just kind of, you can tell he's a, a martial artist and actor, not a actor martial artist. Um, his skills are very impressive. The fact that he's come from multiple backgrounds, he's able to combine the two, and it's just his athletic proudness, prowess, excuse me, is uh, is very impressive. Um, I'd have to say that I enjoy. You know, it, it's not always the greatest plot, but I've enjoyed watching all of his uh, his movies. Um, so, yeah, he's definitely a very impressive gentleman as well. Mm -hmm. Certainly one of my favorite folks to watch on screen and hoping that one day we're going to get him on the show. Uh, anybody oh, that, that, be great. that has that knows his, his knows his history and uh, pays attention when I drop the little hints about what's going on in my life uh, may understand why that may happen. So, okay. oh, I, I, I just like floating stuff out there and just driving people nuts. There, there are people that write in and they, why aren't you more explicit about what's going on? Oh, because I, I like teasing everyone. It's fun. It's, it's That's like right. one it of makes the greatest joys in the show. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned early on that you were passionate about reading. Do you read martial arts books at all? <laughs> Slightly. I have a library and a half downstairs. Okay. My, uh, my family literally makes fun of me now when they, my in-laws are from New York and they come up and they're like, how many new books do you have? So, yes, I, I read quite a few. Are there any that you would recommend to the people listening? Maybe maybe some that they've heard of or some that they haven't? Sure. One of my favorite books, and um, many people have never read it before, it's called The Magic of Conflict by Thomas Crum. Um, he was, uh, he's a avid, uh, I think, Aikido practitioner. And he talks about how conflict actually can be used as a great tool for growth for an individual for yourself, but others as well. Fascinating book. Um, I read it when I was about 12 and I read it every four or five years again, just to kind of remind myself. Um, if you can have that opportunity to read the book, it's, it's very impressive in the sense of he talks about just how the martial arts themselves kind of not only influence your life, but the lives around you in a positive way if you use it correctly. And um, that's a great book. Another book that I just read recently. Um, oh, my gosh. Cannot, I apologize. This is what happens when you've been hit in the head too many times. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck? I can't even think of the name of it. Okay. Um, it'll pop up in a second. I'm sorry. Okay. But I, I've, I've been kind of switching back and forth between uh, European martial arts now as well, trying to um, – oh, I couldn't think of it. There it goes. Um, 
but I'm going to say it wrong. Barit Jitsu. Barit Jitsu. It's a gentleman who came back from Japan studying judo and jujitsu. He made it with Savat and some other um, European martial arts, specifically the cane. And I'm reading all these old articles that were published and put together in one book. And it's absolutely fascinating. It's supposedly what Sherlock Holmes' character was based on as far as their hand-to-hand combat system he had. Um, and the gentleman was definitely an egotist because he named the art after himself. But it's very fascinating. He combined some of the European and Eastern philosophies together. So I just started reading that. Uh, it's interesting also reading back, you know, this, we're talking 1800s, the, the clips are coming out of. Uh, early 1900s, early 1800s. So just the language they use, too, in describing things is kind of uh, hysterical. Um, talking about the secret arts of the Orient and the deadly techniques and things like that. So um, it's a good book right now, so far, what I've read. Cool. Cool. Great choices. And, of course, for anybody that might be new to the show, we put links and, and name all this stuff. So if you're driving or running on a treadmill right now, you don't have to stop or write things yeah. on your forearm. Whistlekick martial arts radio.com is where we put all of our show notes. You've got a lot going on and, and clearly you're, you're just as maybe even more passionate about your training now than when you started, yeah. which is not an easy thing to maintain for 35 years. I believe you said, yeah, it's a long time to do any one thing, let alone enjoy it as much or even more than when you started. So that brings me to why what's keeping you going. What keeps you interested and passionate about martial arts? I think, to be honest, uh, my students, if I didn't have students, you know, I, I have not had a formal, quote, dojo in probably five years. Um, being a principal and trying to run a martial arts school was very difficult. And then having a, little guys. So I'm literally starting tonight. Uh, I'm starting a new class at a, a gym for the first time. I've uh, partnered up with the gym to start teaching. And that's what I've enjoyed. I, I enjoy the students and having conversations. And probably for the last five years, I've been teaching privately. I have a group of like four or five guys who come over and I teach a couple of females, um, you know, self-defense, but I keep hearing over and over again, you know, you need to go teach the public again. And I think for me, it's always growing. The fact of moving from different arts and having different teachers has been very helpful, um, keeping the interest, but also just the fact of, I love when I step into a, a dojo or a training hall or whatever, having that interaction, that, that conversation. And then having someone say to me, well, wait a minute, why are we doing it this way? I don't, I, I never take it as a challenge. I take it as, well, let me think about this and we'll talk why that's the, it's happening this way. Why are you shifting your hips over here? Why is your foot placed here? Why is your elbow coming here? I enjoy that. I enjoy analyzing things. And my biggest challenge for me is I love um, being able to share that with someone who, when I can see they get it and they get excited about it, that's incredibly exciting to me. There are times where, and I've definitely had the blues, as many people who have been in anything for a long time, where I've kind of lost a little interest. And I've had friends who say, hey, listen, we haven't trained in a long time. Let's get together again. And we do that, and it revives you know, our friendship, and it also gets that interest pumping again. I'm incredibly fortunate to have the people around me um, in the arts that I do. I have had some fairly well-known instructors, and I've had some people who train out of their, do- their, uh, their garage still to this day whose skill levels are beyond most anyone I've seen in the public view. Um, and I even asked them, you know, how do you keep doing this? And they explain it's not a choice. And I have to say at this point in my life, it's not a choice. It's ingrained in me. Anywhere I go in the world, anywhere I'm traveling, the first thing I look for is some martial arts school. You know, my wife and I went to Amsterdam about seven years ago and we got into the city and I'm walking around. I'm like, oh, look, there's a Muay Thai school over there. Or, oh, look at that over there. And she's like, oh my God. She goes, we're in a European city. It's beautiful. Stop. Look around the place. I'm like, okay, okay, I will. You know, if I'm in Mexico, that's what I'm looking for. Um, any place I've been, it's just that excitement. There's a certain bond I think we all have for this passion. And it's never left me. Um, and I hope to continue to do it all the way to the day, you know, that I can't. Well said. And I bet we have some folks listening that are nodding along. Certainly I was. What you're saying resonates really deeply with me. If the folks out there want to reach out to you or you know, get a, get a hold of you. Um, sure. You know, how, how would they, how would they do that? Um, I, I either through email or my, you know, my phone number is not a problem at all. I'm very comfortable if that's okay to give that piece. Absolutely. Um, so my email that I use all the time is an old one. It's uh, Harage, H A R A G E I at hotmail.com. 
or 603-479-6007. And no, I did not choose it because it's like James Bond. It just happened to be the number they gave me. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm happy. Like I said, I just, um, tonight's my first night. I'm going to teach my Krav Maga class. Um, and I'm actually in the process now of opening up a school in Hudson, which is a little bit further down the road from where I live. Uh, this gentleman wants me to actually teach all different types of arts at his place. And he's trying to, he's doing an excellent job of enticing me right now. So we hopefully will continue to go that path. And uh, that's something I look to do. You know, I have a, probably another five, 10 years left in public education. And after that, I would love to be more full time of just teaching martial arts. That's my dream, my passion. Awesome. Well, I hope that you do. And I, I hope you continue to find ways to work with people, whether it's youth or adults, it's clear that you're passionate. And it's pretty clear to me, at least that you're having a strong impact on, I'm sure, nearly everyone, if not everyone. And, and that's the goal. And that's one of the wonderful things about martial arts. I really appreciate your time today. And if Thank I could you trouble you, oh, you're, you're welcome. If I could trouble you for just one more thing, sure. we always go out on a, on a, a high note. A, a nugget of wisdom, if you would. You're you're a, you're an educator. You're a martial <laughs> arts instructor. I'm sure you've got dozens of them. But if I could get you to pick just one, how would you send yeah, us out? Um, oh, it's tough. <laughs> I, I I'd, I'd have to say, and honestly, probably the, the big things for me is, you know, as you're training the martial arts, um, allow exploration, allow individuals to figure out what works for them and encourage them to continue to have the exploration. Not everyone is going to fit in a certain pattern or a certain way, but everyone still can enjoy the art itself. Sensei LaChapelle is just an awesome guy. He continues to learn, which I find really inspiring. And it's something that I wish more martial artists were known for doing. I wish it was more common. He's just an amazing person. And I hope you took as much inspiration from my conversation with him as I did. Thank you, Sensei LaChapelle, for being with us today. You can get the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and you can check out everything we've got going on at whistlekick.com, including those sparring gloves that I mentioned during the intro. Seriously, check them out. You won't regret it. Remember, you can find us on social media. We're at Whistlekick. Would love to hear your thoughts on this episode or any of our other episodes. If you want to email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com is the best way to get to me. Thank you for your time today. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for sharing the show and all the other wonderful things that you as an audience do to help this show grow. We have more great stuff on tap in the coming weeks, and I hope you will come back and join us again. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.